Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar from the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre. My name's John Bates. Uh, for those of you that haven't met me before, I'm the Research Director for the CRC. Today's webinar is brought to you by the CRC and the University of New South Wales uh, on fire coalescence and mass spot fire dynamics. What do we now know and how can it be used? This session will be recorded and will be available afterwards from the CRC's website. As we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands from which we're all joining this webinar today. I'm joining from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to any elders that are joining us in the webinar today. Um, today's webinar will showcase findings from the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC research that's been going for some time now on fire coalescence and mass spot fires and share updates of a new tool that's been developed to identify areas of the landscape that are prone to vorticity-driven lateral spread. And while many of you know that active research for the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC concluded on the 30th of June 2021, utilisation of the research is continuing, uh, and this is just an example of one of those projects. We have two speakers today. The first is probably well known to all of you, and that's Professor Jason Sharples. And Jason, um, as you probably well know, is a mathematical scientist and inter internationally renowned expert in dynamic bushfire behaviour and extreme bushfire development. He currently leads several Australian Research Council and Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC projects and is involved in international wildfire research projects. Now, these projects consider various aspects of extreme dynamic bushfire propagation, the development of large conflagrations and bushfire risk management. And his expertise is particularly relevant uh, because of the, of the gap that we see between the predictions of current mathematical models of fire behaviour and actual fire behaviour. Uh, he's also the director of the University of New South Wales Bushfire Research Group. Our second speaker is Dr Rachel Badlin, and Rachel has been part of the UNSW Bushfire Research Group since 2016, when she began work on an ARC-funded project dealing with the connection between deep flaming and violent pyroconvection. And in 2020, she joined the CRC project, working with Jason to develop the spatial mapping tools that you'll hear about later today. Um, so the webinar will be given in two parts, uh, and there'll be time for questions at the end. For the first part of the webinar, Jason will explain the main research findings from the Fire Coalescence and Mass Spot Fire Dynamics Project and, and present some of the outcomes on utilisation, uh, along with Rachel talking about the spatial mapping tool and how it can be used to identify parts of the landscape that are prone to VLS spread uh, and the implications of VLS driven spread for firefighter and community safety will also be discussed. As I said, there will be time for questions at the end. If you think of something as you go through a comment or a question you'd like to ask, put it into the chat uh, and we'll get to that when we get to the end. Um, I'd like now to introduce Professor Jason Sharples and Jason uh, for the first part of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, John, for the introduction. Um, thanks everybody for, for coming along and having a listen today. Uh, I'll also start out just by acknowledging um, talking to you from Ngunnawal country today. So just uh, pay my respects to the, uh, the, uh, the Ngunnawal elders across time. Um, beautiful day here today. Um, but yeah, as John said, what I'm really gonna try and do today in sort of fairly, well, too little time, but um, that's what we've got just try and give you a bit of a feeling for what the, um, the spot fire project was all about and some of the main uh, main outcomes of it. So start out by acknowledging the research team. So um, Rachel, you'll hear from later on, uh, James Hilton was really one of the, you know, the main players in, in this project, did a, did a lot of the work and you know, a lot of these innovations come out of James's head. He's a, he's a brilliant guy. Andrew Sullivan is well known. Um, he led the experimental um, side of the, of the uh, project. Uh, Chris Thomas was a PhD student who we graduated um, working on the project. So I'll talk about some of the work that he did. And also Will Swedish and Richard Hurley from CSIRO, who Will's a sort of a, a graduate researcher, um, very, very bright guy He's himself working with James. And Richard was um, working with uh, Andrew, um, you know, with the, uh, the experiments. Couldn't have got the experiments done without Richard's help. So that's the team and I'll, I'll just launch in. I'm gonna apologize straight off um, for the next couple of slides because they're pretty busy, but I'm just gonna go through them quickly just to really set the, uh, I guess the background, some of the objectives of the project and really the, the rationale for why, why we did the project. 
So I think most people know um, fire behaviour in, in, in the eucalypt forests of Australia and also in many other vegetation types around the world uh, is sometimes characterised by the occurrence of spot fires. Okay? So small fires getting ignited from, from bits of burning uh, leaves and bark and things like that. So under most burning conditions, um, spot fires generally play a minor role. They can be a bit of a nuisance sometimes you know, leading to spot, spotting over a fire break or something like that. But generally they, they play a fairly minor role in the overall propagation of the fire in most cases. Under extreme conditions, however, spotting can become so prevalent that it becomes the dominant propagation mechanism. And the whole idea of a contiguous fire front kind of goes out the window and instead what you end up with is with this, uh, this cascade of spot fires uh, forming what some might say is a, a pseudo front. Um, the issue with that is when you have all these multiple individual fires burning, they all act to affect the behavior and spread of all the other fires around them. Okay, they merge together, they interact with each other in a process which is called coalescence and fire coalescence can lead to rapid increases in fire intensity and spread rate. And this can often occur in some really uh, anti-intuitive directions, for example, completely at odds with the prevailing winds. The zone between two coalescing fires is known as the convergence or the junction zone, and it's an obvious uh, dangerous place to be in for a firefighter. Um, the dynamics of um, fires burning in a junction zone can lead to highly erratic, unpredictable fire behaviour. And that's because the fire, be fire behaviour in these zones is dominated by um, dynamic interactions, dynamic feedback processes um, between the energy released by the fire, different parts of the fire and atmospheric coupling. Now, the real issue is that currently, um, the existing operational fire behavior models that we have don't really account for these types of dynamic interactions that drive fire coalescence. Okay, so they tend to assume um, your fire is burning at an approximately constant or quasi steady rate of spread, which is um, uniquely determined by, by the environmental conditions around it. So there's nothing really to account for the fire, uh, different fires affecting each other. Um, however, we can account for these um, dynamic effects using models. The catch is we've got to use really complex models. Um, so we need really complex models that can adequately describe the types of interactions that we're talking about okay, between the fire, the fuel, the topography, the atmosphere, and so on. And so you have these complex models in, in different flavors. So you have the more computational fluid dynamics um, based models like WFBS and FireTech. And then you have the sort of somewhat less sophisticated models like wall fire and access fire, which basically couple a empirical fire spread model with a um, numerical weather prediction model. Unfortunately, however, in both cases, both of these flavors of, of uh, model, they're really computationally expensive. Okay, so the model uh, run times associated with them, you're talking you know, days, if not weeks in some cases, and of course, you know, if you've got a model which takes longer to run than it does for the fire to actually be um, put out, then that's not gonna actually be a, a lot of uh, use for, for operational applications. So this really brings us to um, the rationale behind the Spot Fire Project. Um, really what we wanted to do is to try and address some of these issues in particular by really getting down and having a detailed look at the processes involved in fire coalescence um, through targeted laboratory and field experiments. Okay, I, I won't talk about those so much today. I'm gonna to talk about some of the other, the modeling developments, but the, the, the field experiments um, and the laboratory experiments did sort of inform the development of those models. Um, we also had a, another sort of stream of inquiry looking at um, fire atmosphere and interactions in great detail. Uh, using um, the couple of models which I just mentioned. Okay, so even though we can't use these models operationally, we can use them in kind of a um, you know, almost as a numerical laboratory to um, explore the different physical processes going on and, and try and understand them better. So the information that we got from these um, you know, laboratory and numerical uh, experiments that we did was then used to basically try and better quantify the physical mechanisms involved in uh, dynamic fire spread and, and fire coalescence and using that information to investigate the potential of coming up with some, uh, you know, some proxies, uh, which will enable us to um, develop models of reduced complexity, which would then hopefully run faster than real time. Okay, and well, we, we kind of did that. Um, we'll talk about you know, the development of the models that we, we have. 
um, they do run faster than real time and they do still um, capture a lot of the, uh, the interesting and important dynamic fire behaviors. Before I get to that though, I just wanted to take a bit of time just to talk about some of the limitations of the traditional paradigm of fire, fire modeling or the conventional wisdom, if you like. Um, so for example, there's a, a fairly widely held, widely held tenet um, that fire intensity increases quadratically with fuel load. Now this came up quite a lot if you were uh, listening to the discussion around the black summer fires and the role that fuel, fuel reduction plays in mitigating those sorts of risks. But the thing to point out is that this, this tenet that fuel, uh, that fire intensity uh, depends quadratically on fuel load really comes from two um, bits of information. The first one is the observation that the rate of spread of a fire is proportional to the fuel load, uh, as we see embodied in formula developed by um, you know, early bushfire scientists, um, for, so for example, in the MacArthur system or the equations that Noble, Barry and Gill came up with. You can see that the rate of spread is some constant multiplied by the fuel load, multiplied by the forest fire danger index okay, in a forest. We also have famous formula like Byram's fire line intensity formula here, which says that the intensity of your fire is the heat of combustion multiplied by the fuel load, multiplied by the rate of spread. And of course, if you take this rate of spread and plonk it into here, then you get the, uh, the thing that people sort of uh, espouse and you see that you have this fire intensity has this quadratic dependence on fuel load. So that's kind of where those ideas are coming from. The issue though, is that both of those formulas are really only valid in the special case of where you have a fire burning at a quasi steady rate of spread. Okay, and it's still quite surprising to me that this seems to be really underappreciated um, across the fire science community and fire management community. Um, despite the fact that it was pointed out by um, Albini in about 1984 and more recently by people in, uh, people like John Dold in the uh, I think it was 2009, John Rady's paper. Okay, so things like Byram's fire line intensity and um, the MacArthur rate of spread equation really only describe quasi steady fire spread. And what we're talking about in some of these uh, more extreme cases is anything but quasi steady fire spread. Um, another I guess, limitation of the traditional paradigm as I've written there. Um, people often think, and they've, they've thought this since the, since the 80s, that you can model the progression of a fire line by basically assuming that all points on the fire line act as point ignitions, which burn independently. So this is the assumption, for example, underpinning the, the Huygens-based um, approaches, like you see in Farsight and, and Phoenix. So just to illustrate what I'm talking about here, just imagine you've got a, a fire line which has been ignited here, that's the black line. You've got a wind pushing up the page. And what you do is you say, okay, well, I'm gonna treat each of those, each point on the fire line as a little independent source of a fire. They all burn some sort of elliptic uh, pattern. Try to press the right button like that. And then your new fire line is just the envelope of all those little fires. Okay, but you see, if you keep doing this, what you end up getting is just that straight fire line propagating uh, almost unchanged. Okay, so if a fire line starts straight and is pushed by the wind, according to this assumption, the fire line will, will remain straight forever. And of course, that's not what we see when we light an actual fire line in, in a real fuel bed with uh, you know, real environmental conditions around it. It basically becomes you know, this parabolic head almost straight away. So that sort of, um, assumption which we, we have as part of our traditional uh, view of how we model fire doesn't really gel when you start to look at the reality of, of how fire spread. All right so getting back to the projects one of the key things that we really need to understand uh, as sort of part of this project is this um, process or phenomenon of pyroconvection okay and, and more to that not just pyroconvection but how um, different parts of a fire can uh, interact pyroconvectively. Okay, so pyroconvective interactions. Pyroconvection is really nothing more than the buoyant movement of fire heated air. And I stress that all fires are pyroconvective and they're pyroconvective all the time. Okay, as soon as you light a match, you have pyroconvection going on. Um, but I guess what we're talking about in terms of pyroconvective interactions is this sort of thing. Okay, so here we have two lines of fire um, parallel to each other. And what happens is that 
the pyroconvection of each fire affects the other. Okay, and what you end up with is this sort of center of convergence, which draws each fire in towards each other. And you can see if you're in plan view, you have initial dashed straight lines, or, um, parallel fire lines. But what happens is you have this, have this center of convergence, which basically pulls the fires toward each other. And, and this is a, a mutual influence that the fires are having on each other. Okay, so yeah, that's not something you're gonna get just by looking at um, a Huygens-based approach. If we go a little bit more complicated and look at a, a case where we have mass spotting, like in this cartoon here, okay, lots of um, spot fires burning. And what's happening is that they're interacting with each other through pyroconvection, and that results in non-steady fire spread. Okay, so no longer quasi-steady. So just in this cartoon here, I've got three different types of, um, I guess, scenario where you can get interactive uh, you know, dynamic fire behavior going on. Uh, the A's are what we call junction fires. So they're sort of these V-shaped fires which, which merge. Uh, we have the B cases here, which are cases of parallel line fires uh, merging with each other, well, sort of. And then we have the other one here where we have a big patch of unburnt fuel in the middle surrounded by fire and that fire will basically collapse in, uh, in, into that central area there. Uh, we call that perimeter collapse, or we could also call that a ring fire. So that's my cartoon uh, version of it, but we can also see that that happens in real life. Okay, so here's uh, the green wattle fire, um, photo still from a video that, that Levi Roberts took, and you can just see the, the mess that's going on here. You've got the, the whole sort of landscape riddled with, with spot fires. Okay, all these spot fires are forming, they're growing, they're merging with each other. And what you end up with is with a big area of, of active flame over a, a fairly short uh, span of time. Why is that important? Well, here's some of uh, Rachel's simulation she did as part of the ARC funded work. I'll just let the video play. Um, what we've got here is we've got different fire shapes. So here's a, a big circle in this column. We've got sort of a, a more thinned out rectangle ratio of four to one in this column. And in this column, we've just got a thin line. Now, each of these fires has the same total area and the same total energy release. Okay, they're all approximately 300 hectare fires. It's just the way that, air, that area has been configured spatially. So here it's a big blob. Here it's been smeared out into a, a line fire, if you like. I'll just play that again. The thing to note though, is that the plumes from the fires which resemble big blobs, okay, more akin to deep flaming, are able to penetrate higher into the atmosphere compared to the fires that resemble a more ordinary fire line. Okay, so this has all sorts of implications for uh, the potential for your fire to um, couple high up into the atmosphere, develop things like pyrocumulonimbus and all the rest. Okay, so there's, there's this link between what we call deep flaming and the development of um, violent pyroconvective events. Uh, okay. All right, so if we come back to looking at our, our mass spotting scenario again, one of the, the key fire behaviors in there was these junction fires, okay, so these V-shaped fires. This is kind of what really got us interested in doing this sort of project in the first place. It was work done by uh, Domingos uh, Viegas back in 2012 with his team, just doing some really basic experiments, but really, you know, which really led to some insightful uh, uh, insightful uh, work being done and just noticing that, well, if you light a V fire like this, then this bit of the fire here at the junction zone really rushes ahead quite fast. Okay, so you have this dynamic uh, interaction going on, which causes the fire to go faster. So you can see it here in, in the uh, actual view, and this is just in infrared. So you can see from you know, here to here, the fires really surged ahead. You've got a lot of heat being generated. So one of the things we were trying to do was try and understand what's going on okay, in this sort of situation. So the experiments that uh, Domingos did um, in this graph here, you can see the points are basically the results that he got. This solid line here is what you would expect the rate of spread to be of this junction point if there was no interaction between the fire lines. So if those two fire lines just um, spread you know, without any influence on each other, then the rate of spread you should get is something like this, um, this uh, black line here. But you can see what Domingos found was that the actual rates of spread were much higher than what this line says they should be. Okay, so that's evidence to say, well, 
there is something actually going on here more than just the effects of geometry alone. There is some sort of dynamic interaction taking place, which is causing these fires to go faster in that junction point. Um, we were able to confirm this using numerical models. So this is some of the work that Chris Thomas did as part of his PhD. Um, what you can see here is the two gray fires, uh, just what you would get if you just lit the fires in isolation and let them run. So the gray fires here are basically what you would get if there was no interaction between these two fire lines. Um, so you can see where the junction point is for those two. The dark line here is what you get when you light them together and allow coupling to take place. Okay, so the black line is what happens when these two fires know about each other and they're able to influence each other's behavior. And so you can see you've got about 750 meters uh, extra spread just from uh, having those two fires interacting with each other. Chris also looked um, at this a little bit more in a little bit more detail and was able to look at some of the, uh, the details of the mechanisms driving this extra spread. And what he found was when you had the two fire lines interacting with each other, you would get all these vorticity pairs. These are basically little sort of fire well couplets, if you like, but they would form ahead of the fire line. So you can see here, they're all sort of reds and blues are sitting in front of the fire line. And what that's doing is it's really drawing the fire into this uh, unburnt region here much faster than it would normally do. If he went and looked at the vorticity attached to a single fire line, then the vorticity would actually occur over the fire line rather than in front of it. And so it had no real effect on the, uh, the propagation of the fire. But yeah, we, we understand the, the dynamics of these things a lot better now, uh, thanks to this sort of modeling that Chris did. Big question though, of course, is we wanna be able to model these sorts of things and we wanna be able to model them faster than real time. Okay, so Chris's simulations took you know, 12 hours or something. We want this to be you know, running faster than a, within a minute or something like that. So how do we go about modeling or developing models which can capture these sorts of effects? Well, the first sort of hint that I sort of got interested in was, well, if you look at the part of the fire which moves the fastest, it's actually the most curvy bit, okay? So it's this real curvy bit here in the corner, which is the bit that moves faster. Okay, so perhaps we could just uh, incorporate some fire line curvature into our model and that would do the trick for us. To do that, however, we had to go beyond the typical sort of Huygens-based simulation approaches and we moved to something a little bit more sophisticated, which is called a level set approach. The level set approach basically thinks of a fire as being made up of three regions. Um, the burnt region, where some function is less than zero, the uh, edge of the fire or the fire interface, the fire perimeter, where this function is zero, and the unburnt region where the function is, is positive. Okay, so the level set refers to the zero level set here, which is the fire perimeter. You have a normal vector and you can um, basically write down an equation for how that um, interface should evolve given an ambient wind, you, uh, you put the arrow on top, and also this. Um, quantity here, which is called the normal speed. Okay, so the normal speed is just how fast the interface is moving in the normal direction all around the, uh, the perimeter there. What we can do is we can make an assumption for the form of the normal speed, just based on the curvature, as I said, so this incorporates the curvature effect. So places where you have more curvature will spread faster. The negative sign just has to do with, we want the curvature pointing in the right direction. So this is negative curvature here, positive curvature here. Okay, so this bit should move faster. Okay, so that's the model we came up with. We implemented it um, in Spark and basically it seemed to do the trick. Okay, so there's the experimental um, results there from Dominguez's work. And here's what our curvature based model does. So it's looking pretty good. Um, we also applied it to some of the CSIRO um, field experiments. And you can see what happens is if you have this initial sort of divot in your uh, fire line, if you don't have that curvature dependence, you never lose it, okay? Well, you'll, you'll lose it eventually, but certainly you've still got a divot here, which looks nothing like the, uh, the curvature of the fire line that we actually have. However, if we include the curvature dependence, so we've got this dynamic interaction going on between uh, uh, the, the fire line, then you do get a pretty good rendering of what the fire actually does. So we thought this was pretty good. Curvature seems to, to be a good, um, quantity to try and predict this sort of fire behavior. But it became apparent to us pretty quickly that it wasn't gonna be a perfect predictor in all cases, because if we go back to our parallel fires 
um, parallel fire lines, the fact that you start off with dead straight lines means that you don't have any curvature. If you don't have any curvature, then you can't have a curvature effect driving this, um, this bulging. Okay, so curvature-based approach is not gonna work here. Um, while it works for our V-fires, as soon as you separate your two fire lines so they're not touching anymore, you're back to the situation where you've just got two straight fire lines, okay? So no curvature, so you shouldn't get a curvature effect. So it's not gonna work in this case either. And the other thing, again, work that Chris did was looking at arc fires and basically said, well, if you've just got different um, parts of the same circle, okay, different angular extents, um, each of those fire lines has exactly the same curvature, because they're part of the same circle, but they behave very differently, okay? So if, if, if it was just curvature driving this behavior, then the fact that these have all got the same curvature means you should have the same behavior, okay? And that's obviously not the case. So that tells us pretty definitively that curvature is not the final answer. And there's just uh, some more of Chris's results there showing the differences in uh, rates of spread you get as these different arc fires burn uh, in on themselves. Okay, and it also depends on um, the size of the fires. The white bars here are for 500 meter diameter fires and the dark bars are for one kilometer, uh, not diameter, radius uh, fires. Okay, so same curvature, but very different um, behavior going on. Okay, so curvature works for some things, but it doesn't really work in general. So we needed to extend our model beyond just a curvature based approach. So this is where we sort of um, came up with the idea. James really sort of came up with this idea of um, basically saying, if we think of about, a, think of a little bit of fire like burning here, like we have on a fire line, here's a little bit of fire. What's going on is you have the fire is sending hot air upwards, but to replace that air, you're sucking in air from uh, the surroundings. Okay, so hot air goes up and you have the U and the V representing the wind sort of being drawn in. So it's sort of an indraft wind. Um, the real um, guess clever bit about it was to say, well, we can actually model this indraft wind in a pretty simple way. And that's using something from potential theory, which originated in electrostatics of all places, but it also applies in many, uh, many other areas in fluid dynamics. And um, so yeah, that was the way we sort of decided to go with it. So we still had the level set model underpinning the whole thing. But what we did um, was we came up with a new form for the normal speed based on the normal component of the wind direction across the fire line. Okay, alpha and beta here are parameters um, used to train the model. We were then able to basically say, well, the wind that we want to stick into this normal speed, we're actually going to take as the sum of the ambient wind, U sub A, and this delta UP, which we think of as a perturbation to the ambient winds caused by the fire. Okay, so the ambient wind plus the, plus the pyrogenic wind gives us the overall wind, which, dri which drives the fire and goes into this, uh, this formula here. How do we get this, uh, this pyrogenic wind perturbation? Well, that's where the potential theory comes in. Okay, so this is standard sort of uh, potential theory. We just obtained the wind as, the, uh, as a potential of some, some function, which is determined by another equation, uh, common to potential theory called a Poisson equation. The thing to note here though, is that this source term is a function of the rate of spread. Okay, so here's the, here's the uh, normal speed sitting in here. So what we've got is we've got the wind is being determined by the rate of spread, but then that wind feeds back into here and back into here to determine the rate of spread. Okay, so you have this coupling built in. The strength of the coupling is determined by this single parameter K, uh, which tells us basically how, um, how strong the indraft wind is going to be uh, given, a, given a, a particular fire intensity. Okay, so that's maths over for the minute. Um, let's just see what this actually amounts to. Okay, so we can go back and this is the picture I showed before with the, uh, the straight line remaining straight. If we turn the coupling off, so our, our strength parameter is zero, so there's no coupling here, then you still get that straight line. So you get exactly what you get for Huygens principle. However, if we start to turn the coupling on and increase the strength, then what we actually get is this uh, fire line beginning to curve like it does in real life. 
We can also start to think about two separate spot fires starting uh, with a, a wind blowing them, and they will actually now be attracted to each other through this pyroconvective interaction that we've built into the model. Um, so how does it work on real fires? Well, we're pretty happy with how it's going. So here's some, some uh, experiments from the pyrotron that uh, Andrew, Andrew led. And so you can see the actual fire and the white line here is what you're getting from the pyrogenic model. Okay, so it's capturing the, the, the curving of a wind-driven fire line pretty well. We can look at the junction fires like we did before. Uh, this column here is what you get if you don't uh, turn the coupling on. And this is what you get if you do turn the coupling on. And so you can see you're getting a much, much better fit to the actual fire spread with the coupling, off, coupling turned on for these junction fires. One of the things that the, uh, the curvature based model didn't work for was separated junction or separated V fires like we have here. But you can see that's not really an issue for the, uh, the pyrogenic potential model. It does a good job of capturing that, that spread, even though you've got a separated V. Now, the other thing we can start to use the pyrogenic potential model for is to start to look at some of the, the things I talked about before. Okay, so I, I talked about this, this sort of uh, this, um, sort of tenant in, in fire behavior science where um, intensity depends quadratically on, quadratically on fuel load. Well, we can, we can test that here, right? So what we've got here in these panels is basically um, a whole bunch of spot fires have been lit. They've been allowed to burn. The top two panels are what happens if they're allowed to burn with the coupling turned on, so fire lines interacting with each other. And the bottom two panels are what happens if the fire line don't interact with each other. Now, the fuel is uniform in all of these cases, but what you can see is you're getting enhanced intensity in places where the fires are being drawn into each other. Okay, So even though you've got a constant fuel load, you're getting these variations in intensity just from the effect of the fires um, influencing each other's spread. Okay, this effect becomes more pronounced if you add more spot fires. So if you have only five spot fires and there's not a real lot of difference between the interacting and non-interacting cases, 25 spot fires, you start to get a bit, bit more of a peak uh, through the interaction. Once you're up to 50 and 100 uh, spot fires, okay, so mass spotting events, you're starting to see a significant difference in the, uh, the power output coming from the, uh, the coupled scenarios. So what that really tells us is when you have these sort of dynamic interactions going on, then intensity doesn't depend quadratically on the fuel load. In fact, it doesn't have a lot to do with the fuel load at all. It's being driven by these interactions. So this is possibly an explanation of why fuel reduction is of diminishing effectiveness uh, under extreme conditions, uh, which is a result that seems to be uh, coming out a lot of the work that's being done. There we going? All right, good. This is just uh, some more work of Chris Thomas's. Um, so what this is trying to do is really trying to calibrate the pyrogenic potential model. Okay, so we had that, that one perimeter K, which measured the strength of the coupling or the strength of the indraft driven by the fire intensity or the rate of spread. What Chris is doing here is he's doing some really simple scenarios saying, if I have just a, a hot piece of ground, um, what sort of wind is generated if I look at that using a coupled fire atmosphere model? Okay, so this is the solid line using more fire. So this is sort of the radial wind profile, strong winds closer to the source, and then they, they die off. Um, the dashed and dotted lines here are what we get from analytical solution of the pyrogenic potential model. Okay, so you can see it's not a perfect fit. And we don't expect it to be a perfect fit because there's a lot more going on in the wolf fire um, model than what we've done in our fairly simple coupling. But the overall shapes look pretty good. I mean, I was actually surprised they were this good. Okay, so there's probably some um, you know, happy medium between these two extremes where you would get a reasonably good uh, fit to the, uh, the wind profile generated from a, a fully coupled model. Okay, so that really gives us, I guess, good confidence that even though we haven't got everything going on in our simple coupling uh, through the pyrogenic potential, we are capturing a lot of the main uh, dynamic features of it. One thing we need to really uh, think about though, going forward is that we have some scale gaps. We've looked at sort of very, very small experiments in the pyrotron, I would possibly say too small. Um, we've looked at large scale simulations uh, using wharf fire. Um, so we have this sort of scale gap in around about the 100 meter fire line 
um, scale, if you like. This is being currently addressed, uh, however, through collaboration with uh, Alex Filkov and, and Trent at the University of Melbourne, looking at some of the some of the larger scale burns that they've done. So that's uh, another project we've got going on at the moment. The upshot of all this, though, um, is to build this into an operational capacity. Okay, so what we've done so far is we've basically built the pyrogenic potential model as an extra excuse me, as an extra module, uh, which can um, feed into the Spark system. So I'm not sure if people have, how familiar people are with Spark, but it's kind of this really modular design. And so having the py pyrogenic potential model just sort of comes in as just having a, another module, which feeds into the main system. So you can see here two, um, I guess, fire spread scenarios with multiple ignitions, a line ignition, and then a whole bunch of spots. Uh, this scenario here is, is without the coupling turned on. So just ordinary fire spread, if you like. And what you can see here is with the coupling turn on. So you can see that all of these fires are having an influence on each other. And the interesting thing is that they've actually slowed the overall rate of spread. Okay, now, one thing we don't have included in this model, of course, is the ability the, for the fire to create extra spots ahead of it, which is something we, uh, we want to work towards. Okay, but this is the sort of thing which, which Spark can, can do already, as, as you can see. Um, one thing I, I didn't mention, which is a limitation of the pyrogenic potential model, is that when we actually defined the potential model to give us that in-draft wind, one of the assumptions I glossed over was that the wind that we were, we were coming up with couldn't have any rotational component, okay? So the wind was irrotational. Now, this is far less than ideal, obviously, because if we want to try and model uh, dynamic fire behaviours like we see in this video, which is from... Montana, southeast Montana recently, um, you can see the clear rotation in the column uh, on the lee side of this hill associated with VLS. Okay, so if we've got a model which doesn't allow us to account for these sorts of rotational uh, winds, then what good is it? Okay, you can see here clearly that if you're talking about vorticity driven lateral spread, the whole thing, you know, the name even suggests it, it's driven by vorticity and so we need rotational uh, component to our, our wind field as well. So how do we do that? Well, there's a nice little bit of mathematics from a uh, hundred years or so, maybe 200 years ago now, uh, something called the Helmholtz decomposition. What the Helmholtz decomposition tells us is that if we have any sufficiently smooth and rapidly decaying vector field, then you can actually always express it as the sum of a irrotational part and a rotational part. Okay, now a sufficiently smooth, rapidly decaying vector field would be something like uh, the indraft into a fire. Okay, if you're far enough away from the fire, you don't feel it. Um, if you're close enough to the fire, then you're going to feel it and you can assume that it's, it's reasonably smooth. Bit of an assumption there, but probably not too bad. So what we're going to do now is we're going to think about this, um, this indraft wind as, as, as a near field effect. Okay, we're not too far away from the fire that we're interested in. And we know, according to the Helmholtz de decomposition, that we can always represent that as a, a non-rotational bit, just like what we had before. But we can add in, start to add in rotational components as well through a different, uh, through another potential function. Okay, so all that really amounts to is that our pyrogenic perturbation to the wind is now going to be this uh, irrotational bit like we had before, but now we've also got this rotational bit. This is the Helmholtz decomposition. We can uh, defy, we can determine this um, source term here just through um, specifying uh, vorticity sources, okay, through another Poisson equation. And then we can combine those just as we did before and feed that back into the level set method. If we do that, then we can start to get things like this happening. Okay, so here we've introduced a source of vorticity and you can see the effect that it's having on the fire sort of causing it to, to curve around with this um, sort of circular wind that's going on. We've also been able to take this a bit further and start to look at how we might use this to model VLS. Okay, so what we have here on the left is uh, one of Colin Simpson's um, simulations. So fully coupled fire atmosphere model, um, war fire, and a simulation time of about 10 to 12 hours on the supercomputers at NCI. And you can see that the, uh, the overall pattern of spread, the wind's coming from the left here, 
This is a leaf facing slope. We've ignited a bit of fire here and you can see the pattern of spread. It's gone up to the top of the ridge and then started spreading sideways in the classic VLS fashion. So that's 10 to 12 hours on a supercomputer. This is what we get if we put it into Spark, uh, assigning vorticity sources all along the, uh, the leaf side of the ridge here. And this is the pattern of spread we get from Spark, but not in 10 to 12 hours, but in about 10 seconds, just on a desktop computer. And even though there's some obvious differences, if we actually look at the pattern of spread that's been uh, determined there using Spark, it's not too bad. Um, it's sort of capturing the lateral extent of the fire reasonably well. It's missing out on some of this extra infill here, but that's the sort of thing that we can, uh, we can play with a bit more, go back and refine. Okay, but I think you know for a, for a first cup, this is this is a pretty uh, pretty good uh, effort to you know reduce the computation time by a factor of about well three or four thousand, and still end up with a pretty good rendering of what the fire actually is expected to do. All right, so the last few minutes, I just want to talk about something we've been working on more recently, which you probably haven't heard about. Um, so mentioned sort of Rachel's um, work that she did as part of the RC project, looking at how um, the influence of deep flaming or different shapes of fire influence the development of the plume. Um, what we've been looking at here is just saying, well, if we think of a frame of reference moving with the plume as we go up, then what's happening with the plume is it's basically spreading out okay, in, a, in a diffusive sort of manner. Um, so we can think of the rate of change of any sort of quantity in the plume, like the temperature, the smoke concentration, kinetic energy, vorticity, etc. We can think about its diffusion just being approximated by um, a diffusion equation, okay, which is this guy here. Interesting thing about the diffusion equation is we can solve it using Fourier transform methods. We can also then start to think about um, trying to represent the way or the ability for a plume to diffuse as it reaches up into the sky. And what we can do is you can think about, well, what was it, what is it looking like down here in terms of its Fourier transform compared to what it's looking like up here in terms of its Fourier transform? We can look at the ratio of the energy spectra of those two Fourier transforms, and that'll give us an index, which is basically telling us how much the thing is expected to diffuse. So that's what we've kind of been doing, working on the, the paper to, to explain all this at the moment, but here's some of the results from it. So what we have here are just different uh, fire shapes, square, sort of more like a deep flaming scenario, thin line, more like a fire front, a point, a bunch of spots, a circle, uh, an annulus, and some, some of the arc fires here. The, uh, the bars here are basically telling you about how likely the fire is to not diffuse before it gets to a certain height. And the interesting thing is if we compare that with some of the uh, results that Rachel came up with, looking at um, maximum plume height for these different shapes, then the sort of trends you have in these, these um, gray bars are similar to the trends that Rachel found in the maximum plume height coming from each of these different shapes. So this is sort of suggesting that this is a, a reasonably good idea to, to, to look more at. Here's an example of applying this index to um, fire, real fire, Mole Creek fire in Tasmania, 2016. What we've got here in the line scans at different times is four fires, A, B, C, and D. And you can see in different stages, different fires had different levels of activity. Okay, so here, fire A is making a pretty good run. Uh, things resembling deep flaming going on here. Um, C here is probably the more active fire. And then in this stage B, again, starting to exhibit things which look a bit more like uh, deep flaming signatures. So how does this uh, index um, dis uh, distinguish these different fires? Well, there's the, uh, the situation in the morning. And yes, it tells us that A is the, the one most likely to, to reach higher into the atmosphere. Uh, if we stick, go through to the 21st, um, C was the more active one here. And that's reflected in the, uh, this bar here. And then if we jump through to the next one, it's saying that B is going to be the real um, culprit here, the one most likely to develop into a violent pyroconvective event. Okay, so these sorts of tools, um, pretty new, but we're, we're keen on developing them some more. So what have we learned? How do we use it? Well, in summary, our investigations have been targeted and they've been multifaceted, looking at you know, mathematical modeling, computational simulation, experimentation, 
and they've allowed us or well, given us insights, uh, new knowledge about how you know, some of the key dynamic processes involved in mass spotting and fire coalescence works. And more to that, it's given us you know, broader insights into, into dynamic fire behavior more generally. Um, we've developed models of reduced complexity. Um, they're able to run faster than real time, but they still seem to be able to capture some of these complicated effects. So this really enables a, a shift in the, in the paradigm or the, or the way that we consider um, fires. The developments we've made to the models were tailor made to fit within CSIRO Spark. Okay, so as such, and this was something we were really mindful of, we wanted these things to be ready to use as, as they're developed. Okay, so Spark, it seems, is going to be the, the basis for the new national operational simulation platform. And so our model developments are, are there ready to go and be incorporated as part of that. Um, there's still, um, scope here, but we've already done this to extent, combining some of the, the bushfire natural hazards CRC research with some of the ARC funded research we've been involved in to provide new insights in how we can better account for fire behavioral drivers of violent pyroconductive events. So this is this, this index that I just, I just spoke about. Development of operational tools are gonna to continue beyond this project. And Rachel, as you've heard, is gonna talk about some that we've already um, been developing. Oops. Where to from here? Um, well, there's still a few challenges. Um, modeling the spotting process itself, itself and the flow of ember laden um, air masses in and around the wild, wildland urban interface in particular is still a challenge. Okay, so we haven't really tried to model um, where spots are likely to occur. We've really only modeled what happens after they, after they form. Trying to understand the stochastic processes involved in spotting is still a, a challenge. There's also this multi-scale um, modeling capability that we need to develop. Um, and I think the real way this is gonna go is gonna be um, looking to automate some of these models um, using machine learning and big data approaches uh, to assist us with operational decision-making. There's still a lot we don't understand about critical fire weather events and how they impact on fuel moisture content across all fuel size classes. So one hour, 10 hour, 100 hour, 1000 hour dead and down and really trying to develop a scientific foundation for the role that live fuel moisture content plays in fire behavior. Okay, these are the sort of big, big gaps we have at the moment in our understanding of these, these, how these large conflagrations develop. Um, a lot of this stuff, as you've probably gathered, is quite technical. Um, and so there's a real need to develop um, education and training materials, which can be um, incorporated into national curricula. Okay, along with that, there's a, a need to really try and increase the level of technical understanding and professional qualification across the bushfire industry. And that could be done, for example, through you know, micro-credentials and things like that. And the obvious, you know, looming spectre of climate change and how that's going to affect the frequency and behaviour of extreme bushfires is, is an ongoing issue as well. So that's all I really had to say. I just really wanted to acknowledge um, the... Uh, the support that we got from the, the Bushfire Natural Hazard CRC, and I've written down a whole bunch of people in particular here. I'm certain I've forgotten some of them, but these people here, I mean, they've almost become like family to us and we couldn't have done the project without, without their support. Um, likewise, the Spotfire Project End User Advisory Committee, we've had so many different chops and changes to that throughout the, the life of the project. I didn't even try to write down all the members, but I think they, they'll, know, they'll know who they are and, they should know that their contribution was, was very much appreciated. Um, the UNSW Bushfire Research Group, um, of course, and also members of the other um, CRC fire behavior cluster projects who um, we, we collaborated with and um, are going to continue to collaborate with into the future. So that's all I have. I'm going to hand over to Rachel now. So I'll stop sharing. Jason briefly touched on the VLS, he, men he mentioned this on one slide. Uh, so I'm going to talk a lot more <laughs> basically about what VLS is and give you some background on the filter that we're producing. I'm going to start today talking about this training video or webinar. We've uh, accompanied it with a training manual, which is the picture on the left. And we're going to update it and distribute it after today's talk as part of like the package, I suppose. It gives a bit more background explanation and it's a probably like a training supplement to this video. So the goal of today's 
training and talk really is just to explain a bit more about dynamic fire behavior as Jason has so I might have to skip through that um, how it can lead to extreme fire development and then I'll talk a bit about what VLS is and describe in some detail to gain an insight into the processes needed to enhance conditions ideal for mass spotting so in other words how are we predicting it and this gives a better understanding of some of the principles that underlie this VLS filter. Then I will give an overview of how the filter works. And finally, we're going to have a look at a couple of little case studies, or rather large case studies, um, to gain some familiarity into the use of the filter and to get an idea of how you, with the luxury of hindsight, can apply it to get a better understanding of whether or not something may have been predicted. And we're going to use a couple of real bar fire events, one from the USA and one from Australia, the Bemboka Yankee Scat Fire. So what is dynamic fire behaviour? Well, Jason's pretty much said all this, but I'll say it again. It's, um, it occurs when basically a fire exhibits a rapid increase in the rate of spread and or intensity. And as well as VLS, another example of fire, dynamic fire behaviour is eruptive fire behaviour. And that's where basically fires accelerate up <clears throat> steep slopes. Um, and also we talk about mass spotting and fire coalescence when we talk about these dynamic processes, as Jason has taken us through, um, that they interact with each other and can cause fires to accelerate in their rate of spread and to merge and interact. So I'm going to touch on this deep flaming again, because um, I guess this, uh, this is what VLS can lead to. And as we've seen, that deep flaming is associated with um, these large extreme fires. So as this is well known, all fires start small, lightning strikes or however, um, but a number of factors can cause them to escalate and to form regions of expansive active flaming that we know as deep flaming. And we have a picture on the right hand side here that shows we've got the frontal fire propagation along the flanks of this fire. And then we have these areas of deep flaming. So the number of triggers that have been identified are strong winds, obviously, um, change in wind direction where the flanks of the fire become the head fire, eruptive fire behavior, which was the steep slopes and the interaction with the fire and the slope, VLS, which we'll have a chat about, and also mass spotting and fire coalescence, which Jason has taken us through. And we also have overzealous use of incendiaries, question mark, um, as another potential trigger. So these four, three, sorry, in the red are examples of dynamic fire spread. And they are problematic, not only because fires increase their size rapidly, but also they may have the, they have the um, ability to catch people in the vicinity off guard and leading to loss of life, property, um, entrapment. So it's a good idea to learn more about them. So this is vorticity driven lateral spread, VLS, the famous VLS that we've been talking about. And this is work from Colin, Colin Simpson. This is a picture from one of his papers. And so it occurs when steep or broken topography and strong winds interact to produce flow separation. So what that does, it creates horizontal vorticity, such as lee slope eddies. And these plumes may then stretch and tilt this vorticity into intense vertical vorticity, which then may cause the fire to spread laterally along the ridge. And we have the diagram there showing these vorticities. As the lateral spread is associated with intense vorticity, it means that ember generation is also enhanced. And the result of lateral spread is to provide a wide line of embers along a ridge line, as you can see here, which may then be blown leewards of the ridge and cause mass spotting and again fire coalescence which then again will lead to deep flaming. Rather than all these words I thought I'd just show a picture uh, where we have the on the top left here so we have lateral spread across the ridge line here we have the wind blowing across spot fires where the number two is and then we have the coalescence of the mass spotting and then we have it here again on a ridge line, more three dimensional to give you an idea of how they um, how it forms.
So this schematic of the fire shows how, I guess, how quickly, as Jason was saying, with the dynamic fire behaviour, these fires can blow up and become extreme. So what we have here is a schematic just to show you, I guess, the, the thought process in why we want to do this. So because extreme fires are pro produced by the coalescence of spot fires, which lead to large aerial fires or deep flaming, if we can identify the conditions for spot fire development early, then it may enable early detection and possibly prevention of the transition from the small fire to the large, more problematic fires. So if you can see here, we have, you know, if we can identify these risk areas in advance, we can then hopefully either get people out early or however we deal with the fire. But that, but that would play a major part in the decision making. So early detection will lead to less entrapment, hopefully. And in the best case, it may even stop the fire spreading even further. Depends on how people can get onto it and where it is. Another thing is if we have a number of fires burning simultaneously, it may help to triage which fires are likely to become more problematic. Um, so again, it forms part of the decision making. So here we have some VLS events. Um, so in the, the box at the top here, um, it shows a number of fires where VLS has been observed to have occurred and be responsible for the eventual blow up. Um, some of the most notable are the Canberra fires in 2003 and the Aberfeldy, the one belong fire, which is the picture below, and the Yankees Gap fire in 2018, which we will look at in our case study and as well as the Green Valley fire. So these photos below, the left hand photo shows the dark smoke you can see here on the right hand side of the fire, um, moving laterally, so to the right, uh, the wind is blowing, I guess, um, away from us almost. And we can see from the line scan this sort of perpendicular relationship between the, the ridge line, the wind blowing across the ridge line and the lateral spread of the fire. And we can contrast that to maybe the fire, the traditional fire, sorry, frontal propagation on the right hand side of that land scan. Okay, so I'm not going to get into the maths as much as Jason. This is it for the maths, I will say. Um, so what we had to do, knowing what we know about VLS, we know a couple of things. We know that slope is important and the direction and how the ridge line is orientated to the prevailing wind. Okay, so we have these two filters. The first order filter is just looking, all it takes into account is the slope and the orientation of the land to the wind or the ridge line, if you think of it like that, or the hill. So the top of, <coughs> excuse me, the topographic slope is has to be greater than a certain number. And now that is determined by the resolution of the EEM that we use, digital elevation model. Okay. We've used we used a 30 meter, a 90 meter, and a 250 meter to do some background initial study into it. Um, and so what we determined was flow separation tends to occur around 20 degrees or greater than 20 degrees. But for the DEMs that we used, we had to scale those slopes accordingly because that value changes depending on the resolution of the DEM. Okay, so but simply put, if we boil it all down, all we care about is the slope threshold. So is it greater than a certain amount? How's the orientation? What's the aspect like to the wind? And we found plus or minus 40 degrees. So it's quite a large arc if you're looking at like that. And so basically we give it a value one if the slope is greater than that threshold that we talked about and that it's within a certain angle of the wind direction. Otherwise we give it a zero. Okay, so think of it as a you've got your DEM and for every pixel we calculate whether or not it's a one or a zero. The second order filter is slightly different as it uses curvature, which we were talking about before. And this is really the second order filter. I won't go into it too much, but it's really to identify the ridge lines. 
so it's that little bit at the top the next slide will show you a bit better what we're talking about um, so what we actually did was we used the ArcGIS Pro to develop this and they have in their toolboxes um, a tool that looks at profile curvature and it helps to identify ridge lines. But this is just version 1.0, I do hasten to add. So this first order filter. So the first order filter just uses the slope threshold and the aspect, which is fine if we have a triangular mountain or hill or whatever. So that will, if you look at where the red line is, that would capture all of that hill. But the reality is, if you look at B, that slope really only captures, it only captures sort of the lower part of the slope. Well, most of it, but it misses out this top bit at the top. So by using a profile curvature, the second order filter, we are actually capturing more of this. As I've said, it still has refinements down the track, which I'll talk about later. But that's the general principle of it. So we, we create this first order filter for each pixel. Is it, is it this or not? And then we also apply the second order filter to every pixel and hopefully that catches the ridge lines which we're missing. This is just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Um, so the VLS filter here on the left. Um, so the ones are basically the green areas and the zeros is everywhere else. We don't really care about the zeros. We're just looking at the areas of risk. And so they obviously relate back to the equations we saw two, prior, two slides previous. So they're the ones, they're the zeros. And just to give you an idea, again, it's more of a visual idea of what the filter does and how it looks is we've done it for 250 meter resolution DEMs 90 and 30. Um, I do have to add actually that what we did as well, we removed in the later ones some of these isolated pixels. So we we put in a, a final post post processing step where we removed little blotches to try and simplify and make it easier for people to see the main areas. Now although it could be argued the 250 meter is a bit too coarse it's actually quite useful for a broad identification of the landscape to see where you know broader areas are at risk and then you can always apply the finer resolution DEMs to zero in or to zoom in um, more accurately into those areas and that picture in the middle is just the location of the um, of these domains in purple. So I wasn't sure today whether people were going to actually be doing this or just sitting back more passively and um, listening. So, but as this is going, well, this is intended to be training material, I thought I would um, take you through it as if you have just been presented with the folder of data. For the training, what will happen is you'll be supplied uh, some folders and it will be called supplementary training. Within that file, you will have the two case studies, Ben Boca and Bridger. Within that folder, you will also have two zip files. In the shape files zip, that gives you things like the domain, um, any data we have for, for example, I think for Ben Boca, we have some polygons where we think VLS occurred, for example, and for Bridger, we have extra stuff. Uh, the Americans shared some, some of their um, data and they gave us all sort of uh, perimeter, fire perimeter, the origin, ignition point, campsites, etc. cetera. Uh, the TIFF files, the VLS TIFFs are hopefully self-explanatory. These are the filters that we're going to use to identify areas of risk. And also with the Bridger one, I'm also going to include the official report, the lessons learnt from that fire um, from Montana. I will also put, oh, I'm not sure if CRC will deal with all this, but we'll put the training manual and a, probably a PDF of this PowerPoint in there too for people to work through. Okay, so I thought while we're talking about this, this is great, but obviously a lot of 
people who are going to watch this will be then be going back to their desks and using it in the real world. So I just wanted to talk about the data that we've done so far for this project. So there's a folder that has shared VLS filters and in there I'm only showing the New South Wales one. So what you have in here, you have two zip files at the moment, one for 90 and one for 250. We kind of agreed as a beginning, it's probably a good place to start. 90 meters will give you pretty much the information you need. But there's the 250 as well, if people want to have a look at those. And so they are basically, we have taken a uniform wind direction across the whole domain so more like you'd think of a well a very large synoptic scale wind and we've just applied it so you just have to know for example what the forecast is for the area you're looking at and apply it it won't have terrain influences on it but it will give you the synoptic flow up to a ridge line and if that ridge line is orientated correctly it will give you an idea of whether vls is going to occur so this is just a starting point and the other thing i was wondering i don't know about what the CRC wants to do, but perhaps it might be useful to allow everyone access to all the states. So if you don't, for example, have much VLS in your state, you can apply it to real cases um, in someone else's or real fires and have a look. So it might be some sort of collaborative um, benefit to this. And just for people who don't use it, the actual files you use are just the TIFF files. All these other ones I wouldn't worry about but you will get them when you unzip them. So I seem to be going quite quickly here. So the first case study we have is the Bridger Hills fire in Montana. So if we zoom right in, we have like the yellow bit here, corner of Montana. There's the blue rectangle is the domain of that final um, the fire itself, Bridger Hills. This red polygon here, in the bottom right hand corner is the initial fire perimeter so this is when the firefighters were sent up there to, to uh, put in a hand line it's just north east of bozeman and this is what the fire looked like and so if, if you think of this picture it's basically looking north so we're south here you're looking north along the ridge line well northerly ish um, the wind is coming Cross, and I'll just read this. So at 1343 on Saturday, the 5th of September, members of a Montana Department of Natural Resources and Conservation Helitac crew from the Central Land Office in Helena, Montana, deployed fire shelters on the Bridges Foothills fire near Bozeman. Three firefighters were entrapped, only two of them had fire shelters with them not cause any unnecessary stress they all survived but their story is quite horrific if people are actually got the folders when they when they watch this um, first thing you want to do is to open up the bridger folder and unzip the shape files and the vls tiffs folder the photo here at the bottom is uh standing to the east looking west there's the Ridge line, that's the Bridger Hills Ridge line at the top there. The red polygon, as I said, is the initial fire. Uh, we have in here the Helitac campsite in purple. That was their opening above the campsite, and this was their deployment site. And this was the approximate escape route they had back. So they were positioned in there in the morning. And what we're going to do is have a look at the conditions that they found themselves in that morning to see whether it was relatively benign or whether, you know, whether it was a good decision, basically. So in the Bridger Shapefiles folder, you'll see a number of shapefiles. And so I put a description of what each of these are. So we have the area of the fire itself. So we, the domain, if you like, of the area of interest. We have an origin, the ignition point, we have the perimeter in the early stages before the blow up. So this initial fire, slightly different. I don't know why, but the one they sent me is slightly different shape to that. We've got the final burn perimeter. So we'll look at that right at the end. Uh, we have the hand line location 
the Hellespot, the location, so there, and so the Helitac campsite. Sorry, that's the one. Okay. So the idea is just to open these all up in whatever software or vis visual software you have. So I use ArcGIS for mine. And then what we're going to do is overlay, firstly, the southerly wind, because that was how the conditions were in the morning. We also have the westerly wind here. So we can then see whether how if you were in the field and you knew the forecast and you were going to apply that how would that affect your decision making now i am not an f fan or any so i'd be very interested in any comments or suggestions at the end that you think we could add or do to this at some point um, so this first step is to open up those files, the origin, handline, helispot, etc., the shape files. And this is the Saturday morning, and now we're going to apply the southerly filter. So, as you can see here, so I'll go back again. So, we've got the helispot and the campsite. So, there's the helispot, that's the campsite. These two ones are just houses that they were trying to protect which is part of the reason they were cutting that hand line but this area here was considered the safe spot it was a sort of uh, grassy field if you like slight sort of plateau on the side of the ridge line which is why I think they had chosen it and they had prepared it too they had cleared it and so I guess as an F band you would say given that filter really all you can see is maybe there is some if the fire's here, there could be some spread here. Does the choice of location for the Hellespot and campsite seem appropriate given a southerly wind blowing this way? Possibly, I don't know. Um, but really, the only VLS risk for, for this particular fire, I mean, obviously you could get spotting ahead there, but it would just be this small area here that would be the most obvious risk. This is the Wind Ninja forecast for the afternoon. So we can see here, this is the ridge line here, where the red arrows are going up to. These are terrain influenced winds. So obviously you have some sort of blocking around the hills. But we're concerned about this ridge line because this is where the fire is and it's a ridge. So being interested in VLS, always on the lookout for ridge lines. And so the, the synoptic wind direction is westerly strong, westerly winds. So what we're going to do now is, if you're working along with this, is to remove the southerly wind tip. And now we're going to apply the westerly wind. And I hope people can see that we now have all this area here at risk of VLS. It's quite a solid area around here. Given that the wind is blowing westerly across here, you can see obviously if the VLS does spread along the ridge line, sort of here and here, you're going to get mass spotting this side of the ridge. So if you were an F ban in Montana, would you be now thinking with the forecast having landed on your lap of moving them out early or changing their location or, or whatever how would that affect your decision making process you also got to think bear in mind with this one hang on so here we go this was the final fire perimeter as you can see it encompassed a very large area so we have the synoptic skin synoptic wind causing spread along the ridge line and then you also have the terrain induced winds pushing it. Plus, you're going to have your mass spotting and fire coalescence going on as well. So you have a few mechanisms that are at play here. So a quick summary. Lightning ignites a fire at uh, 3 o'clock on the day before. Um, the forecast, though, is southerly. So they, I'm guessing that was the decision making on why they deployed the personnel there. Three man crews deployed, only two had shelters, two had to actually bunk up together. Uh, the, the wind change around one o'clock the next day caused VLS all along the Bridger Ridge. 
and resulted in the entrapment. So the lesson we can take from this is knowing about VLS and having the wonderful luxury of hindsight, we can see that the blow up could be forecast and the proximate area of fire spread predicted that the VLS filter captures quite nicely the areas that spot fires could land in. Uh, we also, this is, oh sorry, this is the booklet we have I, well, that we are going to include in the training material. This was the uh, facilitated learning analysis from the Department of Natural Resources. And it's very well worth a read. It, it, it has the personal accounts by many different people, not just the three firefighters, but also all the personnel um, at different stages in the decision-making process, process and also communication and some of the things that they've learned from it. So I'm just going to quickly go here because I see we're up to 2.20 and it's, I think it was an hour and a half. So I'm just going to quickly take you through the Yankees Gap Fire in Bemboka. Now the difference with this one, we don't have the luxury of perimeters and I found it very hard to find much information at all um, in general. So the only thing I can say about the Yankees Gap Fire, we're really interested on the 15th of September. That's the day of the blow up. It had been burning for a month though, however, but there was forecast change in wind direction and strengthening of those winds. It had been hot and dry and the wind speeds were around 100 k's. By three o'clock the afternoon, it was out of control. And so what we want to know is, again, given what we know about it, could we, if we apply the VLS filter, make a reasonable prediction that that would have happened? The wind direction during the dynamic fire spread was west northwest. First thing you would have to do is open up the Bemboka folder and get unzip the shape files and tips. With this one, because we're constrained by less information, uh, we have here a shape file with the domain of the area and also these polygons are hand drawn where it's noted or observed that VLS probably occurred or was a part of the fire spread, the shape of the fire spread. So um, we have a couple of TIFFs in here. We've got these line scans. This is the initial one. So we noticed there were some along here, but this fire didn't really blow up. We're really interested in this one here. And we noticed that the the direction it went was basically along here and then down. So we want to just see whether, given the wind direction that we knew across that ridge line, whether that filter would be of any use. So this was the line scan at 1417. So this is about an hour later. So this is the shape of the fire. And this is applying the VLS filter. Uh, for some reason, I've made it green. Um, I, I think I, I don't know. I said it back on another slide or I, I didn't mention it. But if you're going to use the filter, the best thing is to set the zeros to transparent or no fill and just to have a color for the ones. So as you can see here, that the VLS has been identified along the, these red polygons. I hasn't quite caught that one there and in here. So it has caught the general area. This also, obviously, if we've got spotting occurring, this could have just occurred due to fire coalescence and spot fires. So I'm at the end of my talk. So I just want to say that this is like, as I said before, version 1.0. So a couple of things we want to do. So one is rather than just using the profile curvature function in ArcGIS Pro to use something like the maximum maximum directional derivative to identify ridge lines. We have a case where we know VLS occurred and the filter can be refined further. So this is ongoing work to improve the second order filter part of it. The dynamic mapping capability is something where we want to end up. At the moment, we just have static filters. So you would just pick the one for your area that you need. But the idea would be to read in the daily wind forecast from the agency or some people will use wind ninja i think in queensland whatever that wind data is to read it in and to 
have a filter based on those conditions across that domain or state, as you call it. So it would have to be some sort of Python script to run in each day to read it in, produce a filter and store it somewhere for later um, analysis if needed. The other thing I want to do or we're thinking of doing is we're going to add WA, southern part of WA, uh, really for research, if people want to have a look at anything that happened in a state. If you don't have a filter for somewhere, and when we've missed a bit of the land, let us know and we can just produce those for you. We're also thinking of 30 meter resolution filters. Should anyone need them? Um, it hasn't really come up. People are quite happy with what the 90 meter does. But again, it, it doesn't take a lot of work to produce that as we've just done all the other ones. So it's just a list of references that are linked to uh, the training manual. I think that's the end of my talk. Thanks, thanks, Rachel. Um, just while we're getting the slide uh, taken off and getting the video images up, um, look, thank you, um, Rachel and Jason, for that. If anyone's got any questions, we don't have any questions in the Q and A at the moment. Um, if you'd like to, you can pop pop a question in. And I guess Rachel and Jason, a question from me to you. Is the, I mean, is it possible using the VLS filter that you have to, to actually do a risk map for different parts of, of the country to, to allow us, I guess, to understand even before a fire comes through, where are higher risk places so that that can be part of the planning rather than waiting to understand the weather forecast? Uh, yes. Um, at the moment, I've given it in the format of each state. But if you, for example, had the course resolution, you could just have a risk map and a very coarse resolution for the whole of Australia. Absolutely. Yeah, I guess I guess I was thinking, you know, at, at a, a regional level, at a response area, even with, across an incident control footprint that you can understand, it would be feasible, I'm guessing, and I guess a question to both of you, to do, to look at weather from, from every direction to understand um, the terrain and where are the high risk parts of that, that terrain? Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you had good climatological information on where your you know, worst, worst winds come from, then that could, you could certainly use the filter to, you know, you know target particular regions for, for hazard reduction burning, for example, which is something that came up in the, the New South Wales inquiry, for example, that, you know, if you actually knew that you had these big sort of, uh, you know, Areas identified by the filter where VLS was was really likely on a on a day when you have the winds coming from a particular direction, and if you knew that that's where all all your bad fire weather came from that particular direction, then then yeah, you could use the filter to basically say, well, this is probably something we want to we want to look at a little bit more closely in terms of uh, you know reducing uh, fuels so that you can uh, you know, have more success at initial attack and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with I guess with the fires that at Kangaroo Island uh, like in, in 2019 20, what I'm hearing from the bureau is that the weather, the wind conditions there were unusual. And I guess you know, when you're looking at at uh, unpredictable fires and changing climatic conditions, how do you see the VLS filters being used? And, and I guess all the the other uh, fire behaviour work that you've done, how, how do they come together to try and help the fire behaviour analysts and incident controllers with their with their planning? Well, I think, I mean, overall, it's just about giving uh, you know, giving people involved in planning a better appreciation or a better idea of the, the potential for fire behaviour. I mean, if you're, you know, basing your decisions on, you know, conventional wisdom or, or, or a model which isn't able to, to capture these effects, then, you know, you may not even have it in your head that these sorts of things could occur. And so when they do occur, they they, they take you, um, you know, off guard, and then you you, you end up in a in a reactive sort of management mode rather than a proactive one, which is which is never a good place to be. So I think that's you know over, over overall, that's it's really about sort of you know providing tools which are more faithful to the overall potential, you know, the full potential of, of fire behaviours that you that you could experience, so that when one does happen you'd actually go on, okay, well, I was sort of aware that that might happen. And, you know, hopefully having that awareness means that you're, you've, you've, you know, factored contingencies and, and other things like that into your decision, decision process. 
Yep, thank you. And we just had had uh, I guess a comment come in on the Q and A that that what if if we went down that approach of trying to understand um, where VLS was likely, it would be a hazard map rather than a risk map because it doesn't talk about the likelihood of that going through. So, so, so I guess you know, Jason and Rachel, just to, to wrap up, you know, if, if we go into another significant fire season and we've got you know the fire season in the southern part of Australia coming up soon. Where, where would you see this being used? And if you were to, to, to have a group of F-bands in front of you as you do now, what would your advice be to them about under, you know, what they should be doing to understand what this, what this research tells them and how they can use that both in terms of, of increasing firefighter and community safety, but also in, in their preparations and planning? Well, I mean, I think, you know, there's still obviously a lot of training and, and education that needs to go on for people to implement this um, operationally. Um, this, this training video and, and the, the products that we've created, I think it's really good to people, for people who have gone through those in some detail and really get a good understanding of what it all means. Um, but ultimately, if you, if you do have that understanding, then it's basically an extra, an extra layer of um, information that you can, you can apply um, you know, once you're sort of looking at a fire and its potential for, for doing certain things, um, having that, that filter there, just sort of saying, okay, well, this is, this is the part, these are the parts of the train identified uh, by the filter where, you know, there's a, a likelihood of this happening. I mean, just, just going to that comment, um, it, it, it really is a likelihood. I mean, all the research we've done basically says that if you're above a certain slope and if your aspect's pointing a certain direction and fire gets in there, then it's very, very likely that you're going to have your fire spreading, spreading, uh, spreading laterally. I think that the part that's missing in risk is really the, the, the consequence, but that's getting off the point. Mm -hmm. Having that there just to say, um, you know, if your fire gets into this, then more than likely it's going to spread sideways and, and create lots of embers, then that just gives you an extra level of, uh, of information, an extra thing to consider when you start to, you know, forward on decisions to the, you know, the planning team and incident control people yeah i agree i think it's um i think it comes down to just being aware of it and i think if you look at for example bridger hills um if they had maybe had that tool would they have made that choice so you know i think it, and it also gives f bands a, a chance to play around and feel comfortable with it understand it by having these filters and that, yeah, as Jason said, it will then add to their decision making tools. And the Bridger Hills one for me was really interesting because I'd sort of run, you know, little bits of training as part of the ACT um, RFS um, training courses for the advanced firefighters. And I'd actually had a hypothetical scenario in there. I said, you know, imagine you've got a fire which is sort of, you know, crept over a ridge, it's starting to burn down the hill. Um, According to traditional wisdom, the lee side of the ridge is the more benign region. So the, the standard response is to get in there, get on the flank of it and start cutting a hand line down, down the hill to pinch it off. Now that was a hypothetical scenario. It's pretty much the exact scenario that we saw in the, the Bridge of Foothills um, burnover. So that was kind of interesting that, you know, something that I sort of put forward as a hypothetical thing to actually see it come true was, was kind of, uh, well, humbling, but, um, terrible as well but you know having having that sort of information and making people aware that okay well under under normal conditions yes that's a good place to try and pinch the fire off but given the uh the potential for the wind change that had been forecast and the likelihood of that producing vls then maybe that's something uh that needs to be reconsidered all right thanks thanks jason thanks rachel and, and thanks everybody for joining with us today for the, the seminar i think the tool will be it could be an interesting addition uh, along with the other work that Jason's done um, that hopefully will be integrated into Spark as it starts to move towards the operational um, operational implementation. So thank and you for joining. Just, just to add to, if I could, I mean, if anybody out there is, is, is interested in it and really having a go at it, um, we'd be more than happy to, to work with, with people and sort of hearing what, hearing what they've got to say about and how we might be able to make it better. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Thanks. John. Thanks. No, thanks, Jason. Um, so the, this webinar will be made available off the CRC website and, and the resources that Jason and Rachel talked about as well will be made available. And, and if you've got any technical questions, including the, the formulas that Jason rolled through during this session, um, have a chat to him and I'm sure he can explain them to you. So look, thanks everyone for joining us and enjoy the rest of your week. <laughs>
Thanks, John. Thanks, John.